Hello and welcome everyone. We are honored that you've chosen to be with us here today. My name is Natalie Healy. I'm the Dream Bank Manager at American Family Insurance, and it is my absolute privilege to host you for this very special event today. I have been with AmFam for over 10 years, and I can proudly and sincerely tell you that here at American Family, we truly believe that communities are stronger and the future is brighter when people are actively pursuing their dreams. That's actually why we created Dream Bank, an inspirational community destination and virtual experience dedicated to supporting dreamers everywhere. At American Family, we are authentically committed to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, celebrating and activating these foundations of our mission, vision, and values in countless ways inside and outside of our walls. Today, in celebration of Women's Herstory Month, we are delighted for the opportunity to welcome to the virtual stage, Emily Chang, Emmy award-winning journalist, anchor and executive producer at Bloomberg TV, expert on global technology and media companies, startups, and the future of business, and the self-embodiment of female visibility in business. She's also the author of the national bestseller, Brotopia, Breaking Up the Boys Club of Silicon Valley. Emily is here to share her perspective, passion, and brilliance with us on topics such as the global women's movement, women in business, work-life balance, ways that anyone can support women, her own dream pursuit, and of course, advice that she has for others who are pursuing their own dreams. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Emily Chang. Natalie, thank you so much for that amazing introduction. I am honored to be here with you and help inspire some dreams, hopefully. <laughs> thank you so much. I, I, am, I am confident that, that that's exactly what you're gonna be doing today. So thank you for spending this time with us and with everyone watching here. Um, so let's get it, let's get started. You ready? I'm ready. Okay, awesome. So what a remarkable career that you've had thus far. You have accomplished so much and received so many impressive, well-deserved accolades along the way. So there are a lot of places that we could start with this conversation. But one thing we're really excited to talk to you about is your book, Brotopia, which is about the Boys Club of Silicon Valley. So can you tell us a little bit about the word Brotopia, what it means to you, and then also what inspired you to write the book? Well, Brotopia in my mind is a place where men hold all the cards, make all the rules and make all the money and women get left behind. And an interesting story about that title is my pitch to my editor uh, was called The Valley of Opportunity, which I thought was quite cute. You know, the valley between men and women, a playoff. Mm -hmm the word Silicon Valley. And about a year into my writing process, my publisher wrote to me and said, that's great, but what about Brotopia? Um, and at the time, you know, this is before the Me Too movement, it just felt like such a strong, uh, visceral word. And I didn't know if I was sort of ready to go there. And I spent a month brainstorming other titles and gave them 500 different options. And they said, these are nice, but we really like Protopia. Um, <laughs> and now I've, I've really come to embrace it because I think it says so much in one word about what's mm -hmm. wrong with Silicon Valley. And of course there are Protopias across um, many different industries, but here, especially, you know, you, hear from people like Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, and they create this picture of a utopia where anyone can succeed and anyone can realize their dreams. And it's simply not true. You know, women have about 25% of jobs across the industry. Women make up, you know, 10 to 11% of investors. Women-led companies got just 2%, 2% of venture capital in 2021. This is just last year. This mm -hmm. is after and since we've been having this conversation that is far from a utopia. And I made it my mission to call, you know, essentially BS, um, if you don't mind me saying that. <laughs> no, you can absolutely do that. <laughs> Please be fearless. <laughs> That's really interesting that, you know, that it was, it was something that, um, you were called to, right? That that it wasn't maybe something you were ready for, but that you were being called to. And that I mean to us, that is a step in that's a that's bravery. And so thank you for for bringing that to us and to thank the you. world. I mean, my 
to put it in a bit of context, you know, my day job, I do a show every day about technology. I interview people like Zuckerberg mm-hmm. and Cheryl Sandberg and the CEOs of these companies. Literally every day, I, I have to fill an hour of television with tech leaders and investors. So, you know, it it was certainly scary to think that I would alienate an entire industry. But I, I decided that if I told the truth and didn't exaggerate or over-dramatize, then people would respect me more for it in the name of, yes, let's get more women in this industry. Let's make sure we are tapping all of the amazing minds and talent out there because this is an industry that's truly changing the world and is more powerful than maybe any other industry. I mean, technology is changing how we communicate, how we relate to each other, you know, how our children are being raised. And we need men, women, people of color, people of all different backgrounds in the, in the room, making the decisions about these products and companies and, and, you know, how they can change our lives. And so, um, you know, ultimately I'm sure there's probably a few people who don't want to talk to me anymore, but I don't necessarily want to <laughs> want or need those people on my show. Um, and ultimately, you know, my hope is that it did help galvanize the industry, um, and bring people together on an issue that no one had yet called out. Really, really appreciate that. That's a guiding principle for us too. And we, we are um, particular about doing our best to reflect the, the various um, and the varied dimensions of the communities that we serve. So it's important that we're reflecting the people that we're talking to. And so thank you for you know, bringing that to light. So a lot of your book includes frustrations of being a woman working in Silicon Valley. So can you elaborate a little bit on those issues and ways that women have been pushed to the sidelines in the tech industry specifically? Yeah, well, women are often the only woman in the room. Again, not unusual in some other industries like finance, you know, even in Hollywood and in, 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 in politics. Um, but one of the really the main areas where women are underrepresented is among the top technical talent. So among engineers and engineers really have the power at tech technology companies. Um, they're writing the code. They are building the products. They are making decisions that have a huge impact. And so, you know, a lot of the women I talked to, they loved what they do. They love what they do. They have this opportunity to change the world. They feel but they're tired, they're exhausted, they're frustrated, they're tired of fighting, they're tired of not being listened to, their ideas not being heard, being mansplained. And, you know, it's uh, it's especially difficult when you're surrounded by mostly men. And, 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 you know, you'll see more women being hired at the lower ranks, but of course it starts dropping off at every step of the ladder. And then when you get to the board level, the C-suite level, the people in power, there just aren't, aren't women. Um, and so it's, can be a really difficult, really exciting place to work as, as, you know, many women come to this industry, believing that their dreams can, can, can come true. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, it's in many ways, not, these are, these are stories I'm sure you hear from women across, mm-hmm. across, uh, different kinds of jobs, corporations, organizations mm-hmm. around the world. Um, but in tech, in technology and in Silicon Valley, it is particularly pronounced. So I think that's a perfect segue because in your book, you, t- you mentioned the pipeline problem or this idea of a pipeline problem. So can you explain what that is and some context around it and specifically, obviously your perspective on it? Well, the spark that lit the fire that got me to write the book was really an interview I did in 2015 with a very prominent investor. His name is Michael Moritz. Uh, very, you know, legendary. Had invested in a number of, you know, super successful technology companies. Very well respected. They had no women in their firm at the time, and I had started asking people on my daily show. They're not all represented. What do you think about that? Just trying to hold people to account, not attacking in any way, but in a fairly straightforward and politically correct way, just to like make the point and make sure that people were thinking about it. And I put the very same question, there are no women partners in in your firm. What are you doing about that? What do you think your responsibility is there? Mm -hmm. 
you're deciding who gets to be the next Mark Zuckerberg or the next Facebook or the next, you know, you are giving people tons of money that will enable them to potentially start a new world changing company. Mm -hmm. Um, But all the men making those decisions, all the people making those decisions are men. Um, And he said, well, we're looking very hard, but we're not prepared to lower our standards. And, you know, it was just this alarm bells went off in my head. Clearly all these talented young women out there, you just apparently don't exist to this one investor. And he gave the excuse that women aren't studying computer science and therefore we don't have a lot of people to choose from. That's the pipeline problem. I started doing some research and I went back to the 60s, 70s, 80s, and I realized in the 70s and 80s, women like were earning 37% of computer science degrees, which is, you know, a pretty high number. Mm -hmm. Over the course of the 80s, 90s, the early 2000s, it dropped and plateaued. And that is because there were just fewer and fewer women in the industry they didn't have people to see. They couldn't be what they couldn't see. And they basically started getting pushed and profiled out of the industry. Uh, the tech industry started doing these personality tests that would supposedly identify good programmers. They decided in 1970 something that good programmers, quote, don't like people. And that was actually a box. Does this person like people or not? If they don't like people, maybe they'd make a good engineer. And The research tells us that if you look for people who don't like people, you're going to hire or find far more men than women. That's just what the research says. That's not what I say. (laughs) Um, But also, we need people who like people and care about people and have empathy for the users whose problems they're trying to solve to be building these products that are changing the world. We need more women in these jobs. And so basically, women got pushed and profiled out of an industry that they were thriving in. And then on top of that, you had sort of Hollywood seizing on the stereotype of the antisocial white male nerd. And people just started to believe that that's what a tech person looked like. That's what an engineer looked like. And women started to think, well, I, I don't look like that. I don't belong there. Um, and it's compounded on itself for now decades, which is why we're here today. You know, that is so interesting because, you know, that persona absolutely is pervasive. And I wonder, do you know of any modern or redesigned studies that have decided to ask that question in a different way or try to, you know, come up with what is a different persona for, for these jobs? I mean, I'm just curious if there's additional research now that we figured out that this was, you know, the catalyst or this was the, the, the cause, the root cause, potentially, at least one of them. Um, how do we rethink about that now? Well, one thing that a lot of companies are doing, and this is something that I advocate, is to make sure that you're asking everybody who's interviewing for a job the same questions. When someone comes into a room and they look the part, you are tempted to just assume that they can do the job, ask them easier questions. So if someone has, it's a young white male with a hoodie and a Stanford computer science degree, you're like, oh, this guy is just obvi, obvi this guy. If someone comes in, and they're, you know, a young black female with a non-traditional coding background or maybe no coding background, you might ask that person harder questions. That's not fair. You are basically, the standards are different. The standards are different for the same job. And so you have to create standardized interview and feedback systems. Mm -hmm. Um, Another thing that I really like that, that, that companies are doing is training people in-house. So just because someone doesn't have necessarily the traditional background doesn't mean you can't help them. Um, You can't put them through some sort of internal boot camp and get them ready. And what they found is that um, I I focus on, I I do a case study on on a, a company called Redfin, which is a real estate technology company. They really wanted to hire more women. They didn't want to be uh, blaming the pipeline Mm -hmm. and the pipeline problem. And so they started a training program in-house for women who had non-traditional backgrounds. They put women through these programs. And after they came out of this program, they found that these women were getting promoted as fast as everybody else. They were just as successful as the traditional, the folks who came in with the traditional background. So if you give them the tools Mm-hmm. And the opportunities to succeed, they will. There is no, there's no difference, right? right. There's no difference um, between the abilities of, of women and men. Right. 
it's that exposure and the opportunity. I think that's that's key. I'm happy to say that at, Amer at American Family, we have a talent rotation program where people have the ability to, you know, sign up for this program and be exposed to different parts of the company. And I think that is a small step in the right direction um, because that exposure to those jobs matters. So, um, okay. You also mention in your book, hosting a dinner party, inviting female engineers to attend. Can you share a little bit about the significance of that dinner to you and what its impact was? Yeah. Um, so that was about halfway through my reporting process and I'd really worked hard to get to speak to big names in Silicon Valley, like Sheryl Sandberg and Marissa Meyer and um, Susan Wojcicki, who's the CEO of YouTube. And um, I don't know if anybody remembers this, but a big story in tech, um, a young female engineer at Uber named Susan Fowler mm -hmm. came out with a story that went viral about her experience at Uber and how misogynistic and discriminatory it was. And it just sort of set the tech industry on fire. And in that moment, I realized I hadn't spent enough time with young women engineers in the trenches, the people who don't have power or voice or a platform. Mm -hmm. And so I, um, with the help of, of some amazing women, pulled together a dinner of, of 12 engineers from different companies, Uber, Apple, Pinterest, Google, um, for dinner at my house. And I, you know, I had just had a, a new baby, I had a like, baby crying upstairs. And, um, um, you know, these women, you know, came from all backgrounds. Some of them were on maternity leave or they, you know, had sick parents, you know, everyone kind of came from these different places and we all came together. And this one, it, at, at this one dinner and just started talking about our experiences and they just, all had so much more in common than I think even they realized because they're in their own communities and their own workspaces, very isolated. They don't necessarily have people to talk to. And, you know, they were frustrated. They felt like their ideas weren't being listened to. They felt like no matter how many names they stacked up on their resume, people would look at them and not believe that they could do it, not believe that they could write the code. Um, and these were women, you know, you know, of all different, genders and sexualities and class levels. And I mean, one of them, her parents were janitors and she uh, was a young Latina woman. She said, I feel like people don't see me. I feel like I, people just look right through me. Um, another woman uh, who also worked at Uber, a trans woman, she, this is actually, this quote is, I think maybe the best quote in my book. Um, she said, I spent the first 20 years of my life presenting as a man and people wanting to hear what I had to say. When I made my transition and I started presenting as a woman, people started cutting me off mid-sentence. And she said, I have lived on both sides of this table, and slammed her hand on the table and said, this game is rigged. Like, and I just, it's so rare to hear from someone who's who has lived life from the perspective of both a man and a woman and can explain the difference. Um, and that one really, really stuck with me. Um, and, you know, identity is so complex. It's certainly, it's not just gender, it is race, it is class, it is education. It, you know, do you have a family, not family? Um, you know, everybody has their own personal situation and we need to honor and respect and understand all of that so that people can bring their whole selves to work. Yeah. That's powerful. That, that made the hair in my neck stand up a little bit. Yeah. And you know what, that was one, that young woman, I was giving a talk, one of these in, in Florida and someone came up to me after and said, that's my cousin. I didn't realize that that ha happened. It actually, it kind of, when she made her transition, it broke apart our family because people didn't support her. Right. Um, and I'm so glad that you shared that story because I'm going to reach out. Oh, yeah. That, that is why it, telling, you know, seeking the truth and telling these stories is so powerful and has such a lasting, you never know who's going to hear the right message at the right time. And I think that's, I hope that that exists, you know, in, in this conversation with you today, I hope the right person hears the right message, you know, in this conversation. Um, thank you for sharing that. So, what are continued changes that you would like to see from all of the research that you've done and for all of the conversations you've been a part of and, and things that you've heard and learned? 
what kind of changes do you want to see throughout Silicon Valley now and even and beyond? So first of all, I want to see the numbers change. I mean, the fact that we're in 2021, three, four years after the Me Too movement and women are still getting 2% of venture capital, that is absolutely unacceptable and ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Um, It's not going to change until we see substantive numbers change. We need more women investors. We need more women writing checks. Mm we need more investors writing checks to female and, 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 and mixed gender teams. And we really need people at the top to care. So mm-hmm. diversity can't be, you know, number 10 or 15 on the list. It's not going to happen. Companies aren't going to change unless the CEO cares and makes it a priority. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you can have a chief diversity officer, you can have a team that's focused on this, but if the CEO and the person where the buck stops doesn't care, those people aren't going to get resources. They're not going to have uh, a real mandate for change. Um, So I think that's number one. But something that's really important to recognize is if you are not the CEO, if you are, you know, if you're just you, you're a middle manager, you are, you know, maybe you're the lowest person on the totem pole. Mm -hmm. What I think is so amazing about the social movements that have happened over the last few years, whether it is the Me Too movement or Black Lives Matter, is that you employees have a louder voice than ever before and companies have to listen. And you have social media and these tech tools at your disposal to make your voice heard. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, so I think don't underestimate the power you have to change within your organization. Um, Think about diversifying your own teams and employing some of these tactics in your own sort of microcosm of your organization. Like if you're looking for for someone new, look around the room, who's not represented Mm -hmm. on our team? What do we need? Um, Make sure that you are soliciting ideas from everyone. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't always have to be like a public dress down. So for example, if you're in a meeting you know, someone's like trying to say something or they say something and their point doesn't really get acknowledged and someone else says the same thing. You can easily say like, oh, excuse me, I just want to finish what she has to say. It's like a gentle redirect. And then the person who interrupted is like, I shouldn't have. You just kind of realize I shouldn't have done that. You can also take someone aside afterward and say, you know, don't do that. It doesn't need to be some sort of you're a horrible person. Don't mansplain and don't interrupt. Right. So, you know, the other, you know, obviously you can also, you know, give people opportunities, give them a chance to show, you, you know, you might think, I don't know if they can do this, but let me see, let me give them a chance. You're not going to know if you don't give them a chance. These are all very simple, easy things that we all can do. Um, you know, I'll give an example. My team is actually mostly women. And so when I have an opening on my team, I'm like, we need some guys, um, <laughs> You know, and, and mm-hmm. as soon as I bring on, you know, as soon as you bring on a new person, you can see, you can often see the difference. And recently we brought on a new amazing guy to the team and the conversation changed a little bit. I think in the right way, more dynamic, more ideas mm-hmm. represented. And that is the best way to be creative and make, do your best work to have different voices, different ideas, different backgrounds represented. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good for you for recognizing that as an opportunity, you know, on your own team. I think that that's really important that we're, yeah. we're being reflective, you know, and we can, we can change and impact the corners of the world that we occupy. And that's a way to do it. And I think that's a really important message that people can do that right now, right where they are. So thank you. I had a, a female investor make a joke and she said, I'm looking hard for some men to join my team, but I'm not prepared to lower my standards. So it might take <laughs> <Wow>. some time. <laughs> the irony, that's a, that seems like a well-timed, well-timed yeah. joke. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, so how about looking beyond the field of tech? Um, it's probably no surprise that the research shows that gender biases extend and I mean, expand um, to many workplaces. And so you just shared some actionable ways that, you know, we can make the professional environment uh, more inclusive and how we can, as individuals, whether wherever we are within the organization, how we can make an impact 
Um, but are there ways that companies can make the professional environment more comfortable for women? Because we know that psychological safety is also an indicator of, of success and well-being and retention. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, companies need to track their data. They mm -hmm. need to know what is actually going on in their organization. And it's really easy to, to just sort of oh, I think we're pretty good on this. Uh, but then when you look at the numbers, you see actually you're not. And it's data that needs to be gathered year after year because or, or organizations are changing so quickly. Obviously, you know, right now we're in the middle of this great resignation. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm actually kind of worried that women are going to take a step back during the pandemic because university isn't number one. You've got a lot of people reevaluating mm -hmm. companies that aren't going to be flexible about their policies are going to lose a lot of people and especially women. And, uh, you know, oftentimes the reality is if someone's going to take a back seat in a, in a family, for example, it's the, it's the female partner. So we don't want that to happen. So number one is gather the data. Two is pay. Obviously I think pay is, uh, equity is really important and it's kind of a, it's just a sneaky killer, you know, you, it, most organizations have, would be surprised at how big their pay disparities are. Um, that's data that you also need to, you need to do comprehensive pay reviews year after year after year. Salesforce uh, made some, you know, big waves doing a big comprehensive pay review. They spent an additional $3 million to equalize salaries. The next year they thought, oh, we should be pretty good because we just did it last year and the pay gap had creeped back. So that is, that is really important. Mm -hmm. And look, I think, you know, there's, I, I know more companies are doing events. You know, there are smaller group opportunities for people to communicate um, and kind, kind of share stories. I think all of that is good. I think suddenly are feeling isolated or psychologically unsafe, you know, hopefully, you, you know, you have folks on your team who are reaching out to you mm -hmm. and might see that, but if they don't, you know, look around, you know, try to talk to someone. I think you'd be surprised how many people are, are willing to listen. Um, and I'm not someone who would say, oh God, if something's wrong, you need to go banging on the door of the CEO. I think it's a very personal calculation if you decide mm -hmm. to decide whether or not to, to speak up mm -hmm. and like, think about if you have the support to do that. And oftentimes if I want to get something done, I kind of try to build, uh, build consensus in my own little world before I take something to the top, you know, cause right. you know, I want to know that I have that support. Mm -hmm. And know that need talented companies need talented women. You are in demand. Um, if you are not getting what you need, if you don't feel psychologically safe, you can vote with your feet. Mm -hmm. You can leave. There are plenty of other opportunities out there. Um, I was interviewing a woman CEO yesterday, and she just, you know, this amazing woman who has survived in and thrived in the tech field, despite being it being so male dominated. And she said, surround yourself with people who see the magic in you. And I was like, I just love that. Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm going to surround myself with people yeah. who see the magic in me. And then I, you know, I'm trying to communicate to my team. I'm like, you know, I, I see the magic in you. <laughs> I, you know, I need to be giving that positive reinforcement to others too. Um, and you really just, you don't know what's going on in people's lives. And so I think checking in regularly is so important because you never know when you're going to catch someone or when they're going to share yeah. something. And, um, you know, it just helps you understand people better. Like why is maybe mm -hmm. someone's having a bad day for a reason, right? Oftentimes there is something going on behind the scenes that you don't know about. And if you just connect on a human level, you might be able to dispel some, some tension that, is building because you haven't necessarily had that conversation. Right. Just, I, that makes me think of the, the iceberg poster, right? The things that are going on in somebody's life. We only see the tip of it and then the rest of it is beneath the surface. But I absolutely love surround yourself with people who see the magic in you. To my team who is here and listening today and to, and everyone in my circle, I see the magic in you and I want to, I'll commit, I'm committing to making sure that, that, <laughs> um, 
that's more obvious in our conversations <laughs> moving forward. By the way, American Family Dream Bank sounds like an amazing place to work. And I, I'm, I'm like, can I work here? I want my dreams to come true too. Yeah. We will figure <laughs> so out I a way. <laughs> I love the way that you frame it. And, you know, I think good intent is, is important. And obviously you want to see good action too. Um, but it's just the way that you sort of describe what you want for your team is so beautiful. And um, I'm glad to be try, trying to be part of it. Yes, you, <laughs> you absolutely are because, you know, our, thank you for sharing that. One of our, um, you know, guiding lights is we've always known that we couldn't be the expert in every single dream that's being that's being pursued because dreams are as unique as the pursuer right as the dreamer but we knew that we could focus on removing these obstacles and having these conversations with people to inspire people to dream and and that's exactly what you're doing by being brave and bold in sharing the things that you're seeing and the things that you know to be true. And um, I'm really excited to see um, and hear about all of the dreams that are going to be sparked because of this conversation today. So we'll be sure to circle back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, okay, let's shift gears just a little bit. So can you describe the global women's movement and its impact? And not only that, but we're really intentional about making sure that people not only know about these things in the world, but what they can do. So what are some steps that we can take to support the initiative? First of all, I, I think keep doing what you're doing. Number one, <laughs> it's amazing. I'm so happy to be part of it and helping to be part of your message. I mean, look, we need more women leaders across the board. We need more women leaders in tech, in business, in politics. I'm always, I mean, I think some of the, some of the most, uh, seeing many women politicians lead in COVID, I think was pretty incredible. Like, um, what we saw in New Zealand, for yep. example, just Lucinda, yes. amen. And mm -hmm. let's lift those stories up. That is a perfect example of, you know, I don't know if a man would have done it differently. I, I don't know. But I do think that men and women lead differently. We make different decisions. And therefore, you know, there's not only one way and there's not only one right way. Um, you know, we need women's stories to be told in, in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. um, my book, Brotopia, got optioned and I'm really intent on finding a woman writer. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting the same, you know, well, we, I, we really want a woman writer too, but there's just like not a lot of options. And, you know, I'm like, well, let's give someone a chance. Let's give someone who does not have 25 right. credits on their IMDb an opportunity. I know there's an undiscovered talent out there. Don't, don't tell me that we need women in front of the camera, behind the camera. We need women in media to be telling women's stories. So one thing that a program that we have at Bloomberg that I'm super proud of is our new voices program where we, um, are working to identify women in the business industry who might not be the CEO, but are super talented and could have a lot of potential to do television interviews and be quoted in, in print stories. And gosh, I think it was three years ago now, we did an audit of our own, the percentage of our guests on television and in our print stories who were women. And I believe it was like 10%. I mean, it was abysmal. And so we launched this program. I, every day, you know, t tally up the number of women and send it off. Mm -hmm. We get a number at the end of every month. This is the percentage of your guests that were women. And I believe across the company, we've gone from like 10% to 25% to 30% women in our stories, wow. which is not enough, but it's progress. And we've been super intentional about it. And we identify these, these women across the industry and we give them media training. So they come in for, you know, several hours and like you do mock interviews, you just, you, you talk to them about, um, you know, how and what to say. And, um, then these women have become more regular guests on our programs, which is amazing. So proud of it. It's not enough, but it is that we can do and something that I feel a responsibility to even on my own show, I cover a male dominated industry. And let me tell you, like most of the CEOs are men. Right. Um, and so mm -hmm. I have to work hard. I'm well, I'm sure there's like, you know, a talented SVP 
at this company who can share a, you know, a really interesting perspective on what's, what's happening now. Mm -hmm. Um, and every day when we have a show that has a lot of women represented, we give ourselves a little high five. We're like, great girl power, yes. women's power. Yes. Um, it's, some, it's very, it's something that we're very, doing very intentionally. I think that is absolutely wonderful because what gets measured and tracked gets done, right? Gets achieved. Right. And so it's really important to look at the data and see how that can inform your strategy. And it's also important to celebrate Sure, we have a long way to go, but it's important to celebrate those little wins. Or not, that's not even a little win. That's a meaningful win. Celebrate those along the way. So that's I think wonderful. Too, something else that I've noticed is that a lot of women, you know, so I've been covering Silicon Valley for almost 12 years now. And earlier on, women didn't want to talk about being women. They didn't want to kind of call attention to the fact that they were a woman. Sure. And uh, over time, many of these women are like, you know what? if I don't talk about it, no one's really going to understand how I do what I do. Mm -hmm. um, and so you hear more women talking about their families or calling attention to this issue, being an advocate for this issue. You know, I, for example, I have four children. That's unusual. <laughs> I'm sure many, many women would be like, are like, how do you do it? And I'm, you know, well, if I don't share how I do it, then, no, you know, no one else can learn. Not that I'm perfect. I don't ever, I don't feel like balance truly exists. I feel like it's very much work-life integration oh, and the, like, I'm always going like this, but these are two very important parts of my life. And if there wasn't integration, that wouldn't, that wouldn't make sense. You know, I would be completely pulled in different directions. And I think the pandemic has been good for that. We've been kind of forced to see people's, I'm here, I'm like in my bedroom right now. We've been forced to see people's personal lives and it's created a greater level of intimacy and understanding yeah. that I think is so key to being able to bring your whole selves to work. And, and by the way, you know, this stuff takes work. It takes time. It takes time to check in. It takes time to be intentional about these things, do these events. But the goal is that if you do this and you, um, you work it into your every day, that everything else comes easier, right? If you have a good foundation, strong values that everyone believes in, and, um, you know, you have this sort of social contract with each other, yeah. um, then you can get your best work done, be more creative, be more efficient, be faster. There's no sort of fear and roadblocks within the organization. Um, so it's, so it does take work. It takes work year after year. It takes upfront work, but the goal is that over time things get easier. And if you, at the very basic level, if you hire and promote more women, you will hire and promote more women that compounds itself. Right. Right. Oh, that's, 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 that's beautiful. That feels like the perfect, the perfect segue into, um, you know, this next conversation topic, because as you know, we're celebrating women's history month this March. And yeah. for those, yeah. And for those who maybe aren't familiar with this pronunciation or using this term, um, referring to March as women's history month is a way to honor women's contributions and to emphasize their point of view during the celebratory month. And I think that's really powerful. Um, but we know that it's not just a month, right? It's a year round, always on effort. Um, it reminds me of, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, when there are nine, when is it enough, right? When there are nine. And I, that, that's something that I think is resonant when there's, a, there's 50, 50. Um, so, but in the meantime, how can, other women, how can other women continue to support each other and open new doors and hold open doors for those, you know, who are coming after them? Yeah. Um, well, I think uh, the distinction has been made between mentorship and sponsorship, you know, yeah. mentorship, a, a wise person told me is like sitting down for coffee and giving someone advice. Sponsorship is uh, someone that you can rely on on a more regular basis who will take more of an active role in um, either giving you advice or helping you succeed or, or or pointing you in the right direction. And I think all women can do that for others, whether they are men or women. And I think we can also be more act, we can be more active about finding our own sort of sponsors and reaching out to people across the organization. And some of those will be women and some of those will be men. I mean, some of my biggest advocates are men. Um, I 
uh, one of my colleagues, his name is Brad Stone. He's written a couple of books. He runs our tech team. And, you know, when I wanted to write a book, I, you know, he was my main champion. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, it's a, it's a relationship that now goes both ways, but, you know, I, I'm so, so grateful for the, um, counsel and advice that, you know, I've gotten from him and it can be something just super quick, like, a, you know, just a little chat, like, what should I do? Quick answer. Great. You know, and then, you know, he'll do the same to me. <laughs> like the first line of this story really is very descriptive about this woman's appearance. Do you think that's okay? And I'm like, no, probably not. Let's not write the story that way. <laughs> um, 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 it's making sure those lines of, of, of communications are open. So I think we can, mm -hmm. we can all take a role in helping others, but also soliciting feedback. You know, you're not alone, you know, people mm -hmm. want to help. And yes. I think sometimes you have to ask for it. That's, that's powerful mentorships and sponsorships. I feel like that, that is, that's a key, that's a key distinction. And, and we know that women's empowerment and the global women's movement isn't just about women. It takes allies and men are just as much a part of that because the world will be a better place for men and women, you know, when they're, when it's more equal and when it's more 50, 50. So I think that's a really powerful thing to talk about. I always hope that there are men and women listening to these conversations when I can yeah, because, you know, <laughs> it's not going to work if just women are hearing all of this, you know, men need to be hearing it too. And mm -hmm. by the way, there's so many, you know, along the way, I've met so many amazing men who want to help, you yeah. know, what can I do? What can I do? Mm -hmm. Like talk to me and, 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 you know, sometimes people say things that are a little, off color and you just redirect remember like okay yeah. maybe don't say yeah. it that way this is how you should think about it that's like you can't blame someone for you know being sort of the product of a very lopsided and mm -hmm. often in male dominated or sometimes misogynistic society right yep. like we yep. need to work together to help each other to get to the right place I couldn't agree more. And I've also, I have so many men in my life who I feel the same way about both, you know, in my personal life and in my professional life and every, you know, people I've met along my whole career. And um, I think that that is a really important thing to talk about that they're there. Um, we want to have everyone to have a seat at the table, right. And to talk about how we can help each other be better in so many ways. I just, I love that. That really resonates deeply with me. So thank you for sharing that part of it too. Thank you. Um, okay, so Women's History Month not only <laughs> celebrates women of yesterday and today, but we also look towards tomorrow, right? And so we have this, this belief that um, a brighter future can be built. So what do you think is the future of women's history and what would you like to see? <laughs> um, I just earlier this week did an event for our Bloomberg's New Voices program where it was one of our first it was my first in-person event in a really long time. It was a bunch of women. And I interviewed this amazing woman venture capitalist and I asked her exactly the same question and I loved her answer. So I am going to steal it. She said, and her name is Dina Shakir. I will credit her. Uh, wow. She said, I am optimistic AF. <laughs> <laughs> I am optimistic yes. AF about the future of women. And... I just think there's so much energy and momentum and power and we're so freaking smart mm -hmm. and like have so much to contribute. Like how can the world not change? Mm -hmm. mm. How can the world not bend in our direction? Mm -hmm. And it's going to be slow, mm -hmm. right? It is going to happen in fits and starts. Sometimes there'll be two steps forward and three steps back. But mm -hmm. I do believe we're moving in the right direction. And even the fact that we're having this conversation, which we wouldn't have had maybe five years ago, uh, like all of that is, is so important. And, you know, some, many countries are more advanced than the United States on this count where right. you, know, you have female presidents and prime ministers in other parts of the world. That's right. Hasn't happened in the United States yet. Still got yep. the highest glass ceiling to break. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm optimistic. We've got a woman in, We've got a woman vice president, you know, we've got, we're making progress. Um, 
one venture capitalist said, told me, she said, I think it's going to take 15 years be- before we see real changes in numbers, which is a long time. Wow. That's a little disheartening. But when you are, you know, some of these organizations, like Google's a huge organization. It's like trying to turn the Titanic, mm-hmm. which is why when you're starting a company now, you need to do these things at the beginning. Like if you start out with 50-50, mm-hmm. you are more likely to be 50-50 as you grow, right? Mm-hmm. Um, if you start out with hundred percent men, you're already, you're up against a wall. Right. And so <clears throat> think about it at the beginning of building an organization or even building a team, mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. or putting a group together that's working on a specific project. Just make sure that you have all ideas represented. Yep. Um, and I guarantee the result will be better. Oh. Fifteen years. I I am optimistic AF as well. I I would before before this conversation I would have said I was realistically optimistic, but optimistic AF. I'm gonna get that on a t-shirt. I'll put, no, <laughs> exactly. Put them on a t-shirt. We can yeah. buy them. <laughs> <laughs> so we actually have an um a part of our organization, the American Family Insurance Institute for Corporate and Social Impact, and they are um, venture philanthropists. So they do um, venture capitalist work, but they're looking for um, social impact organizations that are working to close equity gaps across the country. And I am really excited to share with you that there are many brilliant women leading the charge in that part of our organization. And so um, I'd be happy to share more information with you just so curious afterwards, but (laughs) yeah, so um, great, wonderful. Okay, so this next question I have for you is a a little bit more um, personal to you, at least from my perspective. So everyone has their own definition of success. Right. And we have societal, ex, you know, definitions of success that I think we are, it's hard to break away from as far as what we're looking to achieve. But was there a particular moment or realization that you had that to you felt like a true measure of success on your own terms? Hmm. Um, I would say that writing a book is the hardest thing I've ever done. That's right. Harder <laughs> while having a full-time job. Um, and I'm my worst, I'm my harshest critic. So of course, you know, even it's, I, I always want the things that I do to be better, but I think that the fact that I was able to do that, I see is, is a, as a pretty big accomplishment. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I've been a journalist my whole life where I'm telling other stories. Mm-hmm. I'm interviewing other people. I'm not putting myself out there. Mm-hmm. And the book really forced me to be more vulnerable mm-hmm. um, and take on an issue that was not, that was controversial. And there are, you know, like mm-hmm. mostly very nice reviews on Amazon, but there are some people who just don't agree. <laughs> that right. women should of, course. Be. of course. Right. Yeah. There are some people who don't agree. Yeah. And so it was scary to, put a stake in the ground on this topic. And I looked that, you know, I conquered that fear and I, it was not easy, um, but I did it because I believed it was worth it. Mm. And that if I could do my small part to put a little dent, a teeny tiny dent in the universe, (laughs) that that was worth it. And so I would say that that was a pretty big, um, pretty big moment for me. And I'm, it was, it's one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. Of course, like having my four children is probably the most rewarding thing, but you know, writing the book is is definitely, you know, it, 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 it was a big growth moment for me as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and I hope it inspires other people. That is, that's beautiful. And I, that is actually one of the most one of the more common dreams that we hear from our community members is that they want to write a book because they feel that there is a story within them or there is something that they want to share. And we actually put on a program called a book in a year where we have a cohort of people going through it where they're, they're holding each other accountable, but also providing that support and encouragement and inspiration. And um, one of my, I love that. Isn't it great? Yes. (laughs) Love it. Yes. One of my team members who's leading that um, Maddie said that, she has been doing it and it's been the hardest. She's always said that she wants to write a book and it's been one of the hardest, most challenging, kind of sucky experiences, but yeah. she knows like keeping your eye, keeping your eye on the prize that will, it's worth it. So that is so relatable. So thank you for sharing that. 
of course. It's so hard, but it is definitely rewarding. And you work through so many issues in the process. And so it's a, it's a really, it's a very valuable exercise if you can, if you can hang on and you know what, it doesn't need to be a book, right. It could be an essay, um, you know, a poem, poem, right. Mm -hmm. You can just keep throwing ideas into a Google doc and get to it when you can. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> that's, that's exactly exactly the time will pass anyway right yes. so I just like have something yeah. yeah that's great okay so as you may have gleaned from you know thus far as here at dream bank we really do um believe that um communities are stronger and the future is brighter and people are actively pursuing the, their dreams so that's our mission is to be dream champions for people so can you tell us a little bit about the dreams that you're currently pursuing <laughs> well um I want to write another book. And so I actually do have a Google doc filled with random thoughts and I'm, you know, nervous to do it because I know, I know how hard it is, Yeah, but it's a, it's a topic that I care deeply about. And so maybe I will do that someday. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I do a daily show on Bloomberg television and my goal is to always break new ground and uh, you know, tell stories that people aren't telling. So for example, yesterday we, I mean, we've been, we've been obviously covering the war on Ukraine and the many, there are so many fascinating tech angles. There's actually a huge tech community in Ukraine of like thousands, millions, maybe of developers who support and work at tech companies around the world. And so yesterday we had two Ukrainian developers on the show, including one who was like in a bunker in a basement with a phone up to his face um, just talking about their experience and how they're helping their teammates and just what it's like on the ground, trying to escape and move. And his wife didn't leave. She stayed behind to make masks for the soldiers. And I, I just, you know, it was just incredible. And I was super proud of my team for, and for finding these people, you know, convincing them to go on television and taking that risk, which is scary. Right. Um, and so I want to keep telling, telling stories like that to, uh, you know, I think the main, if I could, is to have an impact, I want to have an impact. I want the work I do to matter. Mm-hmm. So whether that is writing a book or what I'm doing on my show every day, like I want everything I'm doing that day to ma- to, to have an impact, to matter, to make a difference. Right. Mm-hmm. That's why I come to work. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if I, if I can have an impact, then that's, I guess, a dream come true. <laughs> and that's, that's your why is strong that you're, yeah. and that's, what, that's, what's important. Oh my goodness. So I think there are so many things to say about today and like, the, and the things that we've gleaned, the nuggets that we've taken away. Um, my favorite is that I will remain optimistic AF and that we should all surround ourselves with people that are, um, that see our magic. So thank you so much for sharing your time and your story and your advice with us today, Emily. I know I've, I've taken away so many meaningful insights and reflections along the way, and it's, it's really been an honor to spend this time with you in conversation. So um, thank you. This is really everything that we hoped for and way more. <laughs> so, <laughs> For that and to you, we are so grateful. Well, thank you. I have also learned from you and I am going to try to incorporate dream inspiration into my team dynamic too. I want my colleagues to be dreaming big and for us to be giving them the opportunities to realize those dreams. Like I think it's just such an amazing framing and I am so grateful that you are you're doing it and doing your little part to change the world. Yes. Oh, thank you. Well, send them, send them our way. <laughs> and for everyone else, so to stay in touch with our, our events and programs and online offerings designed with your dreams in mind, visit us at amfam.com slash dream bank. That's where you can send your team to Emily um, mm-hmm. and connect with us on our social channels. So as we close out this year's Women's History Month, um, what an esteemed privilege we've had to celebrate and learn from fearless dreamers like you and um, who is pursuit of your own dreams empower the many dreams of others and in true dream bank fashion we are excited to continue to do so and to highlight another excellent upcoming learning opportunity that we have we'll be hosting a special four-week black excellence lecture series and we invite you to scan the qr code on your screen to learn more and register to join us for this impactful course 
So thank you to all who tuned in and spent this time with us. And on behalf of the American Family Insurance Dream Bank, we look forward to hosting you again soon. Until then, keep dreaming fearlessly.